Hello and welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast, the show where we interview spearfishing experts, authorities and characters from around the world. To become a better Spiro, come and join our spearfishing community at noobspiro.com. I wanted to share awesome experiences that you can have when you are in the water. And that's why I started spearfishing. I just clamped down on the reel and got drugged down to about 50 feet. And I'd never had a battle like that before in my life. But when you're learning where to hunt and find fish, they're the hot spots. It's where fish want to be. Don't overcomplicate your gear. Don't go diving dressed up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> I actually started off in stubbies with a bloody belt with a pig knife on it. And I've seen this big fin break the surface, roll into the water, look down. Here's this nice big great white. Oh. <laughs> Once your face hits the water and you feel relaxed, and all the other stresses of life seem to disappear. It's a whole new world and it's mysterious, it's magical. Beats the shit out of knitting anyway. Oh yeah. Today's show is brought to you in partnership with Adreno Spearfishing Supplies. Adreno is one of the world's biggest and best spearfishing stores. You can visit Adreno online at spearfishing.com.au or in-store at their Brisbane and Sydney locations. G'day, new Spiro listeners. Thanks for tuning in today. Today's episode is all about keeping it simple. 101 beginner setup according to Turbo. We are going to talk about just what your basic sort of rig looks like in an everyday spearfishing adventure. So Turbo, look, can you give us a bit of an overview of what, you know, what, you, what we're talking about here? Okay, so your basic uh, rig line setup, your apprenticeship, is uh, your gun, your speed spike, your float line, otherwise known as your rig line, and your float and flag. Okay, so the gun connects to a float line, Mm -hmm. which connects to the float on the surface that has our dive flag on it. Correct. Okay, cool. All right, let's start walking through the components. Let's start on the surface with the dive float. Excellent. I'm glad you started there because that's where I ended. So let's go (laughs) with the the float. All right, so now your float's basic, your basic float when you start is going to come in 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 two main types. You, You have an inflatable, we have a hard float. Now, there are benefits to both. I mean, obviously, the inflatable can be deflated and it saves on space. But, however, if you're rock hopping, they do tend to puncture or can puncture if they're not, like, you know, high-quality ones. Mm. Um, and your hard float, obviously, it is nice and hard. You're not going to – you can bash that thing around the rocks. And they're often either a foam with a kind of a, a plastic on the outside or they are plastic blown. So they're – sort of hollow, yeah, made out of a hard sort of plastic. Okay, okay, cool. And what about those flags, the, the bigger float systems now where you can actually store fish in and that? Are they are they good? Yeah, they are. Often they're used by comp divers or guys in really sharky waters. There's a, the problem with those, are, and I've seen one, I actually saw a guy get into the seaway in really high current. And this thing was one of those, I forget the brand, but it was like a almost like a boogie board with inflatable buoys around it and a big flag on it. And it was probably really good in the Mediterranean where there's no current and flat sea. Yeah. But as soon as we got in the sea, the current was just whipping that thing away from him and he had to tow it because it was quite big. Yeah, okay. And the other thing too, it didn't really like being in any sort of swell. Yeah. It was surgy. It kept pulling on his line. Okay. So I definitely, um, I mean, they're fine. But with the smaller ones, I mean, it's really good because you can put your catch on there and it's out of the water, so you're not attracting sharks. But you do have to pull it, pull that thing around with you. Another lesson I learned with floats was like you've got to have that weight on the bottom to provide a counterbalance, so it actually sits up the right way. Yeah, absolutely, because you've got your you've got your float with its flag, yep. right, and the flag becomes top heavy. So a good float's going to be weighted on the bottom. Yeah. So you see the things like the Rob Allen's. Uh, the hard floats will have a weight built into the bottom of it. The Cressy floats are another good one. Yeah, Cressy floats as well. Uh, the Cressy inflatables, they actually have a little pocket that you store a dive float in the bottom. Okay. I've been using a green Cressy uh, inflatable float for a long time. Yep. And um, I found that it works beautifully. It stays upright, tows really well behind the boat. Yeah. So when you're doing a, a drift dive and you tow that float, line, that float it doesn't dive. Yeah. If it dives, it almost pulls you out of the boat. Yeah. So it's really important. I mean, we're not biased by brand, but I started with a Chrissy hard float as well. And uh, I mean, I got a factory second, so it faded really fast in the sun. And then I just bought like cheap, not, cheap paint like from a hardware <laughs> store, like a high vis orange, <laughs> yeah. and repainted it. You know, we won't make any jokes about how cheap I am. Actually, beautiful paint job. <laughs> it lasted a dive. <laughs> I tell you what, and I was taking it out on boats, and the paint was flaking out oh. on people's floor. 
Oh, awesome. As if cleaning out my fish guts it's, wasn't enough. It's not, it's not like you to be a tight ass at all. <laughs> so, but anyway, so yeah, staying on floats. Um, now, floats have got a few other little things to do with them. So a float should, uh, should preferably have a shark clip on either end or at least one end to attach your float line. Yep. Now, a shark clip, <clears throat> we'll post photos of those. They're pretty much the clip used for all sort of um, light spear fishing. I mean, you know, people, I, I don't think use them on dog too. So I think they use like uh, D shackles and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, generally, yeah, a shark clip, it's a really good solid clip. It's easy to use um, and they're usually swiveled, right? Yep. So it takes away the uh, twist in your line. Uh, they should also have some anchor points around your float so that you can attach things like maybe a spare knife or a fish stringer or water bottles or... Or a um, reflective device and whistle. Whistle or your yep. safety gear yep. can go on there. So the other thing about a float that we didn't cover off was like it should be able to support your body weight because mm. um, if you bug it or you've got cramps, you're going to want to have a rest. So, so Shrek, you pretty much use what, uh, like a, a mini male or something like that, this with a float. <laughs> A small zodiac. It's funny you should say that. Go small, on. I've towed around a small zodiac for most of a day one day <laughs> as a dive really? float. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I yeah, anyway, I, I won't go into that. But yeah, um, I was just going to say on the float we have a dive flag, and in mm. America they use a different flag than we do down here in the southern hemisphere. Yep. We have what's called an alpha flag. Yep. That which is the blue and white. The uh, we'll, dovetail. Yeah, and we'll, we'll put that up on uh, noobspirit.com. It'll be in the show notes. But I was just going to say, when you use the alpha flag, it becomes a beta flag. Oh, oh boy, Tish. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's pretty but, good. And the Americans, they use the diver down flag. Yep. As made famous by the fifth Van Halen studio album, I believe. Oh, I love that reference. That's yeah. really good. From 1982, just prior to your death. <laughs> <laughs> you'd still have you'd have that on vinyl for oh, sure I've got it definitely thanks I'll dad i to all the ladies <laughs> I have around and anyway yeah so the uh, the diver down flag um, is red with a white stripe through it running diagonally yep and um, now these flags are really good alright so this this not only makes you visible but it also has legal um, ramifications I guess for boats uh, being inside the area I think here in Australia the alpha flag gives us 30 metres of clearance yep. from boats so be responsible with this. Don't go and dive in next to a fisherman with your alpha flag yeah. and force them to move. But it's uh, yeah, it's 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 really good. Can save your life. And uh, guys getting hit by boats is a mm. far worse hazard than getting um, done by sharks. Absolutely. And if you're out diving on a boat, use a bigger alpha flag or, or um, diver down flag on the boat, As well. so, so other boat traffic can see it easily. The other thing about your float too <clears throat> is a nice fluoro colour. Or something highly visible, super important. No, not just for the flag. I mean, alpha flags here in Australia are blue and white. Yeah, fantastic. If you <laughs> if you got a bit of chop too, and the swells up, and you're out wider, like out you know out in the ocean a bit more, mm. it, it makes you far more visible for your own boaty. Um, so it saves you getting lost at sea. So beautiful. All right, that's our that's our float. Now let's move on to the float line. Spearfishing is all about self-improvement, but there are some things you can buy off the shelf that are going to help you with your diving. Penetrator blades are lighter and more reactive, and they've improved my diving, and I'm sure they're going to improve yours. Yeah, I've recently switched over to Penetrator Carbons, and it's made a big difference for me. I put much less energy in and get a much greater output, meaning that they're an effective fin. They're lightweight and comfortable, meaning that I spend more time on the bottom. So check out Penetrator Blades at penetrator.com or check out our new Noob Spiro Edition Penetrator Blade at noobspiro.com. So float line, what, what materials do people use? What's the sort of common go? How do tight asses like you get started with float lines? All right, so if you're an absolute tight ass like myself, um, I used uh, like a plastic rope. Uh, it's called telecom rope here in Australia. I don't know what it's called overseas. However, uh, it floated well. Um, it was super cheap. I got it from a hardware store and it did everything I wanted it to do uh, over 15 metres. It was absolutely perfect when I started. I then, I still use another really cheap float line and it's sort of, uh, yeah, another plastic rope, which is kind of like a thin version of a um, ski rope. Okay. Once again, it was really, really cheap. Um, I got that from <laughs> Dreno actually, but it was perfect. I'm still using it today. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. tangle. I can't see you paying anything for a float line. No, I probably won't actually, to be honest. I used one of the hard plastic um, once and 
it, it was great. It was super strong, flexy. It was lovely to coil up, heaps easier. The downside was I was diving into a bit of current one day. It wrapped up on a bit of a rock and uh, and punctured it. Fills with, filled with water, and that float line became no good. Now, I have heard that you can um, pump that hole full of silicon, and it'll be all good again, uh, but I didn't. It just converted to a clothesline in my garage. <laughs> Beautiful. But, hang on, to explain that uh, that type of clothesline. So the, what that will be is they will be a sort of a plastic <laughs> tube or hose with a Dyneema insert. Yeah, okay. So the... The plastic tube's then um, sealed at each end with mm. a shark clip on each end or a D shackle or something like that. Yep. And then the all the work is done by the uh, Dyneema line in the centre. Yep, yep. Okay, just to clarify. Yeah, and it was a great float line, to be honest. And uh, But I guess next step up from that is some of these, uh, the rubber ones or the, what, what are the, the silicon-based ones, that uh, the expensive lines that are getting made? Yeah, same, same thing. Yeah, you're talking about the same thing that's got like a, like a rubber plastic outside with a Dyneema insert, I think, same again. But so almost do, like bungee material. Yeah, yeah. But they, they can still puncture. I mean, this is what you're, you're dealing with. So yeah. I don't think it's perfect. I know Rife now has one, which I, I know our dive partner, Bo Armstrong, has. they have like a woven um, plastic rope, but it's got a, 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 a buoyant core. Okay. And that thing's absolutely beautiful. It's like a, an orange and red float line it's quite expensive but it's the top of the line and the thing doesn't um get tangled mm, yeah, it's really right. visible on the surface actually really really good good uh good float line but the things that you need to consider are the depths that you're diving so if you're a uh you know 15 meter covers you for all your shore stuff you know your 10 to 15 meter range and then you know guys move on to 20 and 30 meter lines you you, you don't really want to take a 30 meter line uh, float line into the surf it's mm. going to wrap up get wrapped up on stuff it's going to be quite dangerous for you so um keep it short um we're also going to post up a uh how to on how to shorten a longer float line without cutting it so that you can put this uh coil or knot near your float line and um you and can tie it around and i'm we, we're not going to we're not going to claim that one for ourselves that's actually a chris coatsman uh, something I got years ago off his blog. So that uh, absolutely That's fantastic way. To, Coachman's um, dot, dot blog dot blogspot dot com. I think it is, and uh, yeah, he's got some fantastic articles on there. Absolutely. Now, what does the float line do? It keeps the float connected to your gun, and it also allows you when you shoot a big fish and that fish needs to run, and you need to go up for air, you can let the gun go, go to the surface, grab your float line and hold on to it. And then you can play the fish from there. You can let it drag through your fingers. You can let it tow you around. However you want to uh, fight the fish, you're connected to the fish um, with that float line. Now, if it's a big fish and it dives and it pulls your float under, you can keep an eye on it and wait for your float to surface. Mm. Yep. Yeah, cool. All right. I think we covered off float lines. So, And then another shark clip to the spear gun. Well, before we get to the spear gun, we generally use here a thing called a speed spike. Now, it's a metal bar. Uh, I think it must be about half a foot to a foot long, and it's got two eyelets welded on, an, an eyelet welded on each end of yep. that bar. Now, that's connected to your float line, which is then connected to the gun. Now, what this little metal bar does is it allows you to, once you've shot a fish, disconnect the gun from this speed spike, and you actually drive the the speed spike through the eye hole of your dead fish and yep. thread it up the float line. Yep. And you thread that up the float line and the and the fish, you push it all the way up to the end of the float line and that holds the fish at the float line. Yep, cool. Now, one thing to remember here is sometimes the fish will slide back down. So what you can do is put a what's called a keeper knot somewhere up around your float line yep. and, and you push that through the eye, eye hole, eye sockets of the fish and it keeps the fish up near the float. Yeah, cool. And what this does is keeps your catch away from you, which means that any sharks attracted to your fish are going to be attracted away from mm -hmm. you. Some people also use a nylon stringer up on the float, which we didn't sort of cover. Or And I don't re recommend using a steel one because um, if a shark grabs hold of it, it can take you for a ride. Whereas if it's nylon, it'll, its teeth should cut through it and uh, it'll steal your fish, but it won't take all your rig with you. Absolutely. Yep, good advice. Right, onto the shark clip, onto the gun. Let's just start with a simple setup with a simple gun, okay? You, generally, guys, you're going to start um, probably in your meter to 
vicinity of guns. Yeah. Depending on the clarity and the visibility of your water and the species you're shooting. If you're just starting out and you're not shooting your 80 kilo dog tooth tuna, you don't need a 1.5 meter eight rubbered cannon. No. You don't need it. And honestly, the smaller a gun gets, the easier it is to handle, the easier it is to track. It's just way more manageable. Yeah. And I mean, we talked we talk to Ian Puckeridge um, last episode, and he just uses a, I think it's a 1.2 or oh, it's a 1.3 with a single 18 or 20 mil band, one single band. Mm-hmm. And I mean, no roller head, no, no reels. It's just a super basic sort of kit. Yep. And uh, yeah. And that's that's a seven-time Australian champion. It's been diving for 40 years. Yeah. So he's still doing that. And I know that we spoke to uh, Manny Bova, and yeah, he loves his float line setup. So, I mean, he's got years of experience as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so you're looking at a, a gun that is suitable for the, the clarity that you're going to generally dive in your area. Uh, fairly simple setup. Uh, probably stick to your uh, shooting line made of uh, mono. In case it's like a thick... Jinkai, I guess fishermen call it, um, fishing line. So it's a 200 or 300 pound breaking, yeah. s- breaking strain mono. When you're getting started, um, the guys in your spearfishing shop should be able to help you out significantly with this, but we're not going to go into wood, alloy, carbon fiber breakdown because it is a little bit of pr- personal preference. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the time what guys get started with is what they stay with. And so we all tend to lack a little bit of... Um, um, perspective with with spear gun preference i think so mm. so you've got your rig, that's your basic rig setup so then you've got to learn how to manage that setup okay so obviously you've got a, a line connected to the handle of your gun somewhere so this float line or this rig line so really you've got to learn uh how not to be entangled in it and how it sort of affects your diving so obviously you've got more drag because you're dragging around a float and a line yeah okay now if you've got surface current uh, or there's, you know, chop or swell, that line is going to pull at your handle of your gun. Yeah. So when you're diving, you need to, when you take your duck dive, you need to make sure you're clear of your, your rig line. Yeah. Make sure your, your fins are clear of it. Take your dive, you go to the bottom, you're sitting on the bottom. I like to generally have my rig line out in front of me on one side in, say, my left hand because I'm right-handed, and I hold that out to one side. And I, I then know where that rig line is and where it's trailing to the surface. So if I shoot a fish and I have to let go of my gun, I can let go of the gun and I've got the, the rig line in one hand. I know I'm not entangled in it and I know that it's going back to the surface. And it doesn't hurt to check when you're on the bottom holding your static to make sure your rig line is free back yeah, to the okay. surface. I like now, that. if it runs hard, you can, you can fin back to the surface and just trail up that tight rig line. Yeah, just holding it, holding it loosely in your hand. Yeah. Exactly. It means you know that your float isn't going to go steaming past you. Yep. You're not burning too much energy and you're not getting pulled around by the fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. That, uh, that's really good advice, Turbo. I like that. So, um, yeah, pretty good coverage of well, that's, the... That's what I did that one time I shot that flathead in two <laughs> metres of water. <laughs> I was laying on the bottom for about 90 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a, just a big breeding female. Oh, we're, just, we're just a pair of elite sparrows, aren't we? Yeah, so what else can you think for um, your float line? No, I think there's a pretty good coverage. So, yeah, like just being aware of, of where it is when, you, when you're descending through the water column. And, um, I mean, it's a mistake. We, a lot of guys, you see it when they're starting out, they, they have it wrapped around their fin unintentionally and then they go to dive and get pulled up sort yeah. of halfway through a dive. It's super annoying. And so you do develop these good habits over, over, over a period of time. But um, hopefully this has given you some insights and uh, idea just about how to have a simple, basic setup that will get the job done. I've just got one more thing to say about this, and that is, uh, is the, reason it, the reason it floats is that when you're on the bottom and you're around bombies or structure, it's trailing up from the base of the gun. So that line trails up to the surface to your float and it's floating that line. So that means that when you're cruising around bombies, hopefully it reduces the chances of you entangling. All right. So when you come around a bombie and you're doing your stealth thing or, you know, you, and, and the line doesn't float, it's quite likely it's going to get entangled and that's a real pain in the bum because when you're coming up for air you've then got to stop untangle it from the bomb and go to the surface but you don't really want to be doing that because you're at the end of your breath hold and there's chance of shallow water blackout so that's why it floats the other thing too is if it's visible and it's floating it's really good for your boaty because we've seen it before where the boat's backed over a float line but if it's a nice bright color the boaty's not going to back over it 
downside is it's bright and it's connecting you to the surface. So, you know, some people say with um, skittish species like our uh, pink snapper here in Australia that um, it can scare them. So, yeah, that was just my little uh, note that popped into my head there before, yeah. we, before we leave. No, nah, that's cool. All right, so next week we've got Dwayne Herbert, who's the seven-time New Zealand champ. And? And, he, and, and he's just taken out the Aussies as well. Oh, it's get great. On you, get on you, I'm looking forward to this interview. <laughs> his his dad was a um, commercial diver, and Dwayne actually started diving when he was seven years old. Yep. And uh, we talk, we t- take quite a deep dive with him into hunting kingfish. Mm-hmm. And uh, like guys, some guys might be like, "Oh, kingfish, they're you know they're or yellow the, tail to our American friends." Yeah, they're one of the easier species to shoot. Well, I'll tell you what, Dwayne's got something for you. Um, there's some really awesome stuff when uh, when we chat to him. Absolutely, can't wait. Awesome. Catch you guys. Thanks for listening. No, you hang up. (laughs) G'day guys. Shop with our sponsors, spearfishing.com.au and support our show. Now, today we've talked about float lines, floats and spear guns. You can buy all of this stuff at spearfishing.com.au. You can use the code NOOBSPEARER at checkout or in store and save $20 on all purchases over $200. I know that's where I bought a lot of my equipment starting out. Turbo, you? Yeah, mate, got a lot of stuff there. Um, kept it nice and simple to start with. Yep. And uh, still do. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to today's show. Make sure to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. To learn more about becoming a better Spiro, visit us at noobspiro.com and subscribe to our newsletter. Turbo, why would listeners want to subscribe to the Noob Spiro newsletter? Well, Shrek, if they subscribe to our newsletter, we will send them the Noob Spiro guide to getting started, which includes the dive day equipment checklist. Not only that, you get the top 10 tips for becoming a better Spiro from the world's best and more. Can you give us an example of one of those tips? Get a mentor. That's one that pops up a lot. Ah, nice. Like I was to you. (laughs) I'm in.